I want to welcome uh, former Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, uh, David Miliband, here to the Kennedy School. David is a member of Parliament for, uh, for the Labor Party. He's spending the week with us as a Fisher Fellow. We've just had a terrific, nearly two-hour discussion with Kennedy School students about Iran. And David, let me ask you first about um, the European crisis. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to Iran. Good to be with um, you. Nice Enjoyed to be with you. Enjoyed meeting your students. Thank you. Um, the Euro debt crisis uh, has expanded into, at least in the minds of some, a real question about the future of the European Union as a political entity as well. How much damage has been done to the concept of Europe, and where does Britain fit into Europe these days? Well, I think that the damage has been to Europeans and outsiders' view of the European Union's ability to get its house in order. That's the damage, because what Europe has revealed is an inability to get to grips with a very fundamental problem. That fundamental problem is that the European Union is a balance of intergovernmentalism, mm -hmm. national governments cooperating, and supranationalism, the sharing of sovereignty on trade issues or, in the case of the European Central Bank, on interest rate issues. And that compromise has been cruelly exposed in the Euro crisis. Both skeptics and federalists have said, you see, we were right. The skeptics say, we knew this could never work. The federalists say, we knew there had to be a political union, not and a fiscal union, not just a monetary union. And that's left the European Union in quite a dangerous limbo. It's consumed all the attention. It's taken time and energy away from a whole range of other issues. And I think that it, in that sense, it's become a European Union crisis, not just a Euro crisis. Right. And um, would it be fair for me to say, my words, that Britain, as a result of this crisis, has distanced itself from the European Union, decision-making in the EU, but also to a lesser extent, perhaps even from a formerly very tight, close, special relationship with the United I States. I think that the, if you had a representative of the current government from the UK here at the moment, they would say, yes, we are. We have uh, distanced ourselves from the solution of the Euro crisis. We, they would say we vetoed the incorporation within European Union treaties, the new fiscal pact that will govern the decision making, not just of the 17 Euro members, but also of uh, at least eight other European Union members who want to associate themselves with the treaty. And members of the current government, I think, would say that we're well distanced from that. People like me fear that the Euro skepticism inside the Conservative Party is dangerous for Britain because it will never be satisfied. The beast of Euroscepticism will only be satisfied when they've got Britain into a not just a semi-detached but a detached relationship. Obviously the Labour government decided not to join the Euro but we were always clear that we try and make sure that in non-Euro areas we were ahead of the game not behind it whether on energy or foreign policy. The current government take a more semi-detached view and I, I think that's got real dangers because the current position for Britain may not be a steady state and that's the danger that Prime Minister Cameron now has to wrestle with because his party isn't satisfied and the rest of Europe isn't satisfied either. So looking beyond Europe, um, the largest most complex security problem we face now internationally is, is the Iranian nuclear pro program. Um, there are negotiations set for Friday April 13th to begin with the P5 plus one in Iran uh, on the other hand, the Israeli government has been, has been very insistent. This is an existential problem for the Israeli people, and perhaps the use of force is the better way to resolve this problem. Is there a chance for diplomacy to make a difference on Iran in 2012? Well, there, there, there is a chance, because as long as there are talks that, are, that seem substantive and productive, it's hard to see a unilateral strike. I don't see the Iranian issue as a bilateral Iran-Israel Iran issue. It's a multilateral collective problem, collective security issue. And it needs the leadership of the five permanent members of the Security Council plus uh, Germany uh, at the heart of a solution. And I think diplomacy on, on Friday week has got an enormous challenge, which is to try and overcome decades of mistrust at, under the clock and under the spotlight. And that's really very challenging. I, I, I think it's vital that they succeed, because I think a war in the Middle East would be utterly disastrous uh, and, and very hard to control, actually, and very hard to um, keep within, within any kinds of bounds. I think that there is something to go on, though, which is that there, the logic would suggest that an Iran which is willing to fulfill its responsibilities under the Non-Proliferation Treaty should be able to exercise its rights under that treaty. 
Now, at the moment, neither is. It's neither able to exercise its rights nor able to fulfill its responsibilities or nor willing to fulfill its responsibilities. And the challenge for the negotiators is to bridge that gap. Right. So ultimately, if there is to be a success in the negotiations, Iran will have to accept basic responsibilities and, of course, not to, to, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt is not going to have a military dimension to its nuclear policy. But we, on the other hand, the United States and others, will have to accept that Iran will have some type of civil nuclear program. Well, it has a civil nuclear program at the moment, supplied by the Russians, obviously. Right. And the, 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 the rubber hits the road on the question of, I don't know if you use that expression in, in, in we do. We do. on the question of whether it should have a domestically supplied civilian nuclear right. program. I think that that prospect was held out by the agreement in May 2008 that you, the administration that you served w was party to. I think you just left office uh, yes. then in April 2008. But th that notion that there could come a day when Iran could supply its own civilian nuclear program was established. Now, I don't think it's news to say that could be the ultimate vision. Getting there is going to require some very careful sequencing because we all know that it, if Iran thinks it can get something for free, it'll grab it. Right. And if it thinks it's only going to get punished, it'll never do anything. So it's a very narrow window to achieve progress. I think the most important thing is that the Iranians realize the severity of the risk they run because the f there are plenty who uh, of, of, of doubters about this diplomatic process. Now, fortunately, they don't include the President of the United States. He's been absolutely clear that he wants this process to succeed, and he's said absolutely clearly where the red line for him is, which is Iran becoming a nuclear weapons state. And that seems to me to have got the red line in the right place. Now we've got to fill in the time before Iran reaches that in a productive way. So both of us in government dealt extensively with the Iran problem. One of the questions is, will we have the patience to work through these very difficult issues over a sustained period of time, many, many months, perhaps even longer than uh, up to a year, before we'll, we'll be able to understand if we're making progress at, or not? Well, I think that uh, patience is a great <laughs> virtue and it's a necessity in this case. I think that the chasm of mistrust is obviously under the microscope in an election year for you. And the mistrust that can be exploited for political ends is obviously real. Uh, the notion of bipartisanship in foreign policy seems to have broken down here pretty fundamentally. And so it's obviously a double focus for the administration. They're focused on the talks. They're also focused on minding their own back. And I think that there needs to be some recognition on Russian and Chinese parts that they're part of a team on this, and they're going to have to play, play by the rules. Right. Let me ask you about Afghanistan. It's the other great challenge, particularly for our two countries. We have so many troops serving. They've sacrificed. We've lost soldiers there. How is the war going to end? Will it end at the negotiating table? Well, I think there's, a, it, 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 there's only two ways it'll end. It'll end with us pulling out and, a, and some form of high or low grade civil war ensuing. Or there is still maybe just the chance for us to sponsor a serious negotiation. You said negotiating table. Uh, there, there aren't really the, the conditions the, or the, 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 the institutions to sponsor that at the moment. I, I've said very clearly the only way out of this conflict is a domestic political settlement with all the tribes in. Within Afghanistan. Within Afghanistan, yeah. supported by a regional political settlement. Right. All the neighbors on side. And the deal is all the, all the people's in, all the neighbors on side, Al-Qaeda out. Beyond that, it's got to be for the Afghans to, to support it. Now, I now think, and I've been advocating, that you can only get this done if you have an independent UN-sponsored mediator who talks to all sides. This phrase, let's let the Afghans do it, there's no trust in the Afghan government from their own people, never mind from the Taliban. Uh, and I think it's essential that there's some kind of independent player drawn from the Muslim world who's able to talk to all sides, all the parts of the insurgency, all the neighbors, the Afghan government, some, all of its supporters, and also us as the West, because we have security interests, we also have legacy interests that we need to do justice to our legacy and of intervention. And I think until you have that kind of sponsored mediation, there's no chance of a negotiated settlement. So Britain has said it, it will withdraw its troops in 2014, along with the other NATO troops. The United States has said 
it will withdraw many of its troops, but it plans to have a military presence beyond 2014. Is that absolutely excluded on the part of Britain, that Britain might help in the training of the I Afghan I think forces? the West has not distinguished itself by the unity with which it has made its announcements. You've got some talk of American combat operations stopping in 2013, the Cameron government running to catch up, now right. saying it's not quite clear when our combat operations will, will, will start finishing, but they will finish finishing at the end of 2014. It doesn't look very pretty at the moment. It doesn't look very coordinated. French have got their own timetable. They're the next biggest contributor after you and uh, us. I think that the, the, the lack of clarity about the end game for the West is a big part of the problem. Yep. We're going to have to put our cards on the table. Uh, the truth is that everyone knows Pakistan matters much more for our own security. Uh, enormous damage has been done to Al-Qaeda uh, through a Pakistani route or on the Pakistani side of the border. Um, I think that the long-term relationship between America and Pakistan matters far more than the long-term relationship between America and Afghanistan. And if there's one chilling phrase that really makes me shudder. It's when I hear people in America say they should, that you should cut your links with Pakistan and that you'd be better off setting them off on their own because that is a route to disaster. And we've tried that before. You've tried and that before. It, and and, it, and, and uh, it, it didn't work, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Final question, David. Um, you're a longtime observer of the United States. You were a Kennedy Scholar at MIT. Uh, as Foreign Secretary, um, you had a very close trusting relationship with Condoleezza Rice as well as Hillary Clinton across two very different administrations. Um, how do you look at us right now in our, in our global role and whether or not you know, the American people are prepared to continue to play that global mm -hmm. role? I mean, I tell you what I was really struck by. I, I heard the president who I think has a very, the current president has a very um, compelling view of how America has got to reposition itself in the world, but he did say nation building starts at home. Yes. And then I went back to President Clinton's last State of the Union address. And what does he say? It's remarkable. He says our work has got to be at home. So there you have, before the Bush years and after the Bush years, you have presidents who are, have an internationalist cast of mind, nonetheless saying America's domestic problems are so pressing that we need to deal with education, healthcare, energy, domestic problems. And I think we therefore see an America that has had a decade of enormous foreign engagement, but that looks more like a step away from its, or a, a step that it, it is taken reluctantly rather than with great uh, enthusiasm. I would say that in the modern world, solving one's domestic problems is intimately linked to the sort of world that we're living in. And my hope would be that a, a re-elected Obama administration, and I, I'm a politician here, I'm coming from the uh, center left of the political spectrum, not the center right. Um, so in that sense, I, I was the chief diplomat, but I was a diplomat with a political hat on. Um, I would hope that a re-elected Obama administration does get to grips with America's domestic problems, but recognizes that they are going to be solved quicker and more effectively by continued global engagement, not by global retreat. And I think that's really important at a time when the world has changed fundamentally. And America is the only superpower, but it can't just <coughs> click its fingers and expect the world to come to heel. It's a, it's a world in which economic power has been distributed far more widely than ever before. But it's a world that needs American engagement because Retreat is going to take away one of the anchors, and it's dangerous not to have anchors. Thank you, David. Thank you. And thank you for your visit to Harvard University, your commitment to uh, the transatlantic relationship. We appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.